We want to think today about a lesson that's uh, been on my mind and um, first time that I've shared this lesson with anybody. I uh, started turning it into a bulletin article and I decided, you know what, I need to preach on that. And so I erased the bulletin article and decided to, to go ahead and share this lesson with you today. I think it fits in a little bit with the theme of um, uh, Thanksgiving this weekend and being thankful for what we have. But uh, perhaps you've heard of the greener grass syndrome, you know. Um, you've heard the phrase, maybe the grass is always greener on the other side. And, and that's a saying which speaks to our desire to always think that things are better somewhere else. In farming terms, we may think of that as the cow that leaves his own pasture because, you know, the grass is greener on the other side. The grass looks better in the other pasture. And so he goes searching for a new pasture. Uh, but when that cow gets stuck in the fence on the way to the other side, the reality of the situation tends to damper the previous optimistic expectations of the cow. And sometimes the same thing can happen to us. We think that things are better on the other side, somewhere else, doing something else, but sometimes the real problem lies within ourselves. And if we're being candid, the greener grass syndrome may very well be a spiritual weakness. And I want to think about that with you today, um, with the intent of overcoming that greener grass syndrome. Now let's think about some areas where this may be the case. You know, this is a temptation for all people, from, from toddlers all the way to retirees. Uh, there is no age group or social class that is immune to this greener grass mentality. It, it just surfaces in different ways with different people. Uh, for example, have you ever seen a toddler, a toddler's quiet, quietly playing with a little toy on their own on the floor, and then there's another toddler that, that comes in with another toy? Uh, what is that? toddler often do, who was content and fine with the one toy that they had, well, a lot of times they just, they forget about what they were playing with, and then they go try and steal the toy from the other kid, right? They drop theirs, and they try to steal it. Uh, ever had a teenager? I've got three of them. So have you ever had a teenager who frustratedly said, you know, I just can't wait until I move out? I just can't. And have you ever thought to yourself, I can't wait till you move out either? You know, or maybe they want to go to college. Maybe they're looking for a new career. Maybe they just want to live by their own rules. Soon, the teen's going to realize that when you move out, there's going to be work involved. There's going to be bills to pay. There's going to be responsibility when you get on your own. And the grass might seem greener on the other side, but you start to feel the burden of adulthood once you move out. Singles can start to think this way. There are some single folks who long for a mate and they think that all of life's problems are going to be solved once we are married. But I would encourage you not to rush that decision because a person can be just as frustrated and just as lonely married as they are single. It's good to want to marry, but don't get in a hurry or you might get buyer's remorse when you do. So be careful. And sometimes married couples can have the same temptation. Sometimes married people think, you know, I wish I had a husband that was a little more like him. He washes the dishes. Um, he opens the door for her. And sometimes women can think that. Sometimes men can think, I wish I had a wife a little bit more like her. She takes better care of herself. Her home's clean. Um, some are willing to leave their marriage behind for the prospects of a new one. But the one who breaks one vow to make another one is soon going to learn that the new spouse comes with problems which will require working out as well, not to mention there's going to be a spiritual price that is going to be paid. In Proverbs chapter 6, we've been studying Proverbs in our high school class, and there's an awesome context that I think all men need to consider and read when they consider being tempted in that way. But it says, here's going to be the consequences of adultery, verse 32. Whoever commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He who does so destroys his own soul. 
Wounds and dishonor he will get. His reproach will not be wiped away. Jealousy is a husband's fury. He will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will accept no recompense, and nor will he be appeased, though you give him many gifts. Your reputation is going to be harmed. Your soul is going to be harmed. Certainly there's going to be vengeance um, from those who you have hurt. Not to mention that when you get into that relationship, you find out that there's work to do in that relationship too. I was talking to an older friend once about a similar marriage situation in the church. He said, you know, people think the grass is greener on the other side, but when they get to the other side, they realize that that grass needs fertilized and mowed and trimmed there too. And so the grass doesn't get green without some work. Some married couples spend their time, though, dreaming of living in the perfect locale. Sometimes that's what we are looking for with greener grass. We're looking for a better location. We want better scenery to look at. Uh, We want the perfect job. And I would ask you, what's that say to the people, to the city, to the people that you're around now, when all you talk about is leaving? It's discouraging Um, when people down your town all the time. What are we? You know, dead meat? over here, uh, right? chopped liver, as my parents would say. Um, sometimes we have that greener grass mentality. Retirees, widows, widowers, we can have this mentality, though. Sometimes a traumatic life change can make us want to leave. I've seen older families who lost children to the world. Their children became prodigal children. And I've seen them sell their houses, move out of town, away from the jobs that they'd always worked because they thought it would help them in their grief and their sadness. They just didn't want to see anything at all that was related, that made them think of that child because of the hurt. We may have the same desires when we lose a mate, we lose a family member. We don't want to be in that house anymore. We don't want to be in that town anymore where we have so many memories. It haunts us. We just want to leave town. But that won't necessarily change the hole in our hearts from that loss. Sometimes as we near retirement, we talk of moving down south to a better climate with scenery more to our liking. We think the grass is going to be greener if we move somewhere else. We'll be, we'll be happy then. And sometimes church members can have the greener grass mentality. We can have it in a couple of different ways. Although we've left sin and darkness Sometimes people want to go back into the world and do the worldly things that they were once doing in the past because that looks like fun to them again. Jesus warned of people. He said, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. If you're going to make the decision to follow the Lord, you need to not look back into your past and start trying to live that sinful life again. Sometimes, though, our desires as church members, they're matters of covetousness. Look at Exodus 20 and verse 17, and look at the final commandment of the Ten Commandments, and it deals with the problem of the heart. And I think it deals with what we're talking about in part today. Exodus 20 verse 17 says, You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. And sometimes the greener grass is that I wish I had that house. I wish I had that spouse. I wish I had that toy. I wish I had that car. I wish I had that boat. I wish I had that motorcycle. I wish I had the job they have. I wish I could wear the clothes they have. I wish I could take the vacations that they take. But if we are strapping ourselves with unbearable debt in order to obtain what we see others have, then we may be doing ourselves a regrettable disservice. Look at Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 7. If you ever listen to Dave Ramsey, this is a verse that you've heard him quote. Um, The rich rules over the poor, the borrower is servant to the lender. The borrower is a slave to the lender. When you strap yourselves with all kinds of credit card debt, you're going to get yourselves uh, feeling a lot of regret eventually because you're just going to have to keep working to pay all that off. Sometimes, though, church members just grow weary in doing good where they are, and they start looking at jumping to a different church, thinking that things will be better if they just go somewhere else. And so we can have that temptation as well. 
And so those are some various ways, some various reasons, some areas where we might have that greener grass mentality. And, and I want to be clear, there are legitimate reasons to make changes. I mean, God doesn't condemn change, per se. Sometimes change is necessary. Sometimes change is needful. But I'm asking you today to be honest about your motives and desires and to make sure that what you desire is not just a self-serving want, but it's for our spiritual good and the spiritual good of those around us. Let me give you some Bible examples of people who carried out this greener grass mentality. Let's start, first of all, with the original greener grass guilty party, which is probably Lot from the Old Testament. Uh, Samuel read to us from Genesis chapter 13, where we read about Lot. But in Genesis chapter 13, notice verses 5 through 13, we won't read the whole context again, but Abram and Lot are living on the same area of land. Change was going to be necessary, by the way, because they couldn't support their flocks and their pastures. So there needed to be some sort of change that took place. What I want you to think about when you think about Lot is I want you to think about the reasoning behind why Lot made the decision that he did. When you take a look at it in Genesis chapter 13, notice we'll move on down to verse 9. Abram has a very good attitude. He says, look, you pick, you pick where you want to go and I'll go the opposite direction. And the reason why Abram does that is I don't want you to think I'm being greedy. I don't want you to think that I'm picking the best land. I don't, think, I don't want you to feel like you're being shafted here. Um, I, I, I'll just let you pick your way, and I'll go the other way. Because he says, we're brethren, we're kinsmen. I don't want any fighting between us. We're family. And so verse 9 says, Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. If you go to the right, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. What's that mean? Grass was green. That also means that there's, there's food for his flocks and there's water for his flocks. And so it's a place where he felt as though he could make more money, he could be more prosperous, um, he could take care of his animals better. And so he was looking at the, the, the material aspects of the land where he was going to move. It was beautiful, it was scenic, it was like the garden of the Lord, and yet it was also good for his business. So Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. But I think verse 13 is really the passage, the, the verse that we need to consider here as we look at the big picture. He chose that land because of the material benefit that he would gain from it. But verse 13 says, But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. He goes somewhere that looks beautiful, but the people there are rotten. And that's where Lot makes the decision that he's going to move his family. And we know what happens to Sodom and Gomorrah eventually, right? Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed because they are evil and they are wicked. And Lot and whoever will come with them has to leave the town. So I wonder how many times we might be guilty of the same. Materially, when we think about our decision, everything looks good. But we don't consider the spiritual aspect of the decision. Just like Lot didn't consider the spiritual depravity of the land and how it will impact him and his family. If you read 2 Peter chapter 2, it says that Lot tormented his righteous soul day by day because of the evil of the people in that city. It might have benefited him financially, but it tormented him spiritually. I want you to think about ex some examples. Our teens, they want to go to school somewhere, and they are looking at a school because the college campus is beautiful. We want to move somewhere because there are mountains or beaches. We think about that. It's beautiful. I like the mountains. I like the beach. I like the ocean. I like to hear the water. I like to hear the breeze. The seniors' only community has a beautiful golf course in the backyard, and we can play for free every day. Sometimes that's why we make our decision. Or the money's good in the area. They're paying really well for the job that I happen to work in that area. That's the material benefit. 
But have we considered the spiritual aspect? Have we checked into the churches in the area? Will we be able to make a spiritual impact where we're going? Will we find spiritual encouragement in the places where we're going? Don't make the same mistakes that Lot did. Achan in Joshua chapter 7 is another example of what the greener grass syndrome will do. In Joshua chapter 7, if you're familiar with the story of Achan, in Joshua 6, they have just destroyed the city of Jericho. They are told when they destroy the city of Jericho, they are not to touch any of the spoils or the loot from the city. But Achan makes the mistake of thinking that he could steal something from the city without consequence. And so he steals a little gold, he steals a little silver, and he steals a Babylonian garment that he thought looked pretty good. I don't know, probably like the Gucci or Tommy Hilfiger or something of his day, right? And, and so he hides it in his tent. Well, the next time that Israel goes out to battle, they lose. They lose because God says, hey, someone has violated my will, and I'm not going to bless you when you're not doing my will. So you need to find out who it is. And of course, they find out, and it's Achan. Now, think about the situation here. God was going to give the nation of Israel an entire land after they conquered Jericho. But that wasn't good enough. Achan just had to steal a little bit of extra gold, and he had to have that Babylonian outfit. And his theft brought trouble to his own house and to the entire nation because he couldn't just be content with the victory and be patient with the reward. Have you ever wondered, by the way, why did Achan's family have to be punished along with Achan in that story? And I think the simple answer is this. He hid the gold and silver in his tent. It's not like he had a big five-bedroom house where he could just hide it without anybody knowing. Everybody in the family knew he had stolen that, and nobody ratted him out or held him accountable. They were all accomplices to his sin, and because they were accomplices to what he did, they were held accountable as well. Point is this, when our covetous desires lead to stealing or to embezzling or to lies, then we've got a little bit of aching in our hearts. And that's the greener grass syndrome. Sometimes the greener grass syndrome is sinful because it leads to sin. David provides us an example of the greener grass syndrome and what it looks like in the family sometimes. And he does so when it, he sins with Bathsheba. David already had a wife. Bathsheba already had a husband. That as soon as David sees Bathsheba's wife while he's window peeping from his rooftop, he had to have her. And in so doing, he ruined a marriage, he tarnished his reputation, he killed off a loyal soldier, and he lives the life of a hypocrite until Nathan comes to correct him. And that's what the greener grass syndrome sometimes will also do. It will ruin your family. It will ruin your reputation, especially if it's in a situation like a marriage. We ask the question, why could David, who already was living a good life, why couldn't he just be content with the wife that he had and just leave Bathsheba alone? That's what the greener grass syndrome will do to you. It feeds on your lust. Sometimes we just can't be content that enough is enough. Elijah gives us a different example of the greener grass syndrome playing out in the prophet's life. And I want you to think about Elijah. We had a lesson on Elijah back a while ago in 1 Kings chapter 19. But Elijah had done an incredible job in 1 Kings 18 standing up for God on Mount Carmel. All right. But he's tired of his work as a prophet, and he's tired of the persecution that it brings, and he runs away to the wilderness, and he tells God that he wants to quit. So for Elijah, the greener grass is found in a place where he can quit serving. He's tired of doing so much for God. He's tired of being asked to serve. He's tired of the burden of always having to do work for the Lord. And he's tired that he doesn't feel like anybody else is joining him. He feels like he does it alone sometimes. Now, maybe that's a temptation for us. I know preachers, I actually know a lot of preachers in the last four or five years that have quit preaching because they're just tired of serving. They're tired of it. They're tired of some of the problems that arise when you preach. They're tired of criticism tired of having to move their family, and so they've just quit. 
Some elders give up the work of eldering because they just don't want to do the work anymore. They're tired. Some Christians leave congregations because they want to go somewhere with a lighter load and less responsibility and less expectations. Some retirees, they move off down south so they can just live out their bucket list. I've known several examples of Christians who had parents in their old age who needed family nearby to help with their health problems and help with the kids, and and they just moved states away too far for mom and dad to be much help in a time of need. God calls you to care for your family just as they did for you when you were helpless when you were little. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 8. Where do you read of this idea in Scripture of quitting and retirement from the Lord? When the voices in our head are telling us just to quit, then we need to hear God's Word telling us endure, persevere, and Jesus saying to us, serve. Because the greatest in the Lord's kingdom is not the one who quits serving, it's the one who serves. And of course, we could look at the New Testament and we look at the examples in the New Testament of greener grass characters like the prodigal son. And that would probably top the list of people with a greener grass syndrome. When you think about the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, he has it made. He's got a place to live. He's got a job. He's got an income. He's got an inheritance coming to him someday. But he thought something was better out in the far country, and he left home, so he goes search for it. And after he hits rock bottom, he comes to his senses and realizes that home was not so bad after all. And he makes his confession to his father, and he comes back. The literal lesson is applicable just as the spiritual lesson is here. Sometimes we leave our physical homes to go find greener grass somewhere, and we realized that we got ourselves in a bunch of trouble. We weren't ready for that yet. But of course, the spiritual lesson is that sometimes we leave God the Father, who gives us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places through Jesus Christ, and we leave Him, and we're searching for wells that are without water. We're looking for blessing where there is none, only temporary thrills and highs. Well, what do we need to do to overcome some of these temptations? What are some of the keys to overcoming the the greener grass syndrome? I'm just going to offer to you a few things here as we finish up this last particular point. And it's this. First of all, keys to overcoming. One of the keys is avoid comparing yourself to others. Avoid comparing yourself to others. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17. And I think this is such an important passage because it's so easy to compare yourself to others in this age. Uh, I mean, when others, if you're on social media, they're flashing their Instagram pics and their Facebook pics and and, uh, their Tic Tac stories, and they're showing you where they're vacationing and how awesome their houses are and the new car that they bought and how awesome their family is and how beautiful everything seems to be. We can sometimes put on this um, fake front on social media a little bit too, where we only see the good things and we don't see the reality of the situation. But it's easy for us to look at all of that and think, man, my life really stinks here. You know, look how beautiful they are. Look how awesome their house is. Look at the nice car they're driving. Look at where they're taking a vacation. Man, I haven't even got out of Anderson for a couple of months. <laughs> we can start thinking that. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 17 says, um, that's not the right scripture verse right there, so that's not a good one to look at. Don't look at that one. Okay, there's a verse in Corinthians, and it says, don't compare yourself to other people. And if someone finds it, shout it out to me, because I obviously miscited it here. Um, Why don't you think about Vlad for a minute? Vlad just got baptized a week ago, okay? Vlad, it wouldn't be very smart for you to say, you know what, I'm really upset with myself and I'm really upset with my spiritual life because I'm not nearly as mature as Vernon over here. I don't think anybody expects you to be as mature as Vernon, Vlad. Vernon's been a Christian for a long time. 
He's got a lot of scripture under his belt. He's got a lot of sermons under his belt. He's got a lot of encouragement. He's probably a lot of, made a lot of mistakes under his belt too, and he's had to figure some things out. Yeah. I've heard him say it. That's the only reason I'm saying that. It wouldn't be very smart for you to compare yourself to Vernon and to expect that somehow you're going to be at the same level spiritually that he is. It's going to take time and it's going to take growth to get there. You see people do this sometimes um, with their, their newlyweds, and they see the way that somebody who's been married for 50 years, you know, they've, they've got this nice house, everything's put together, they've got the dining room set, they've got the centerpiece and all the placemats and the china cabinet, and everything just looks so put together and perfect, and we're brand new, and we're, we're borrowing a couch from mom, and we got a hand-me-down bed from grandma, and we got an old TV that, you know, isn't a flat screen, and we think, man... We're living in a pretty janky place. But guess what? I bet 50 years ago, grandma and grandpa were living like that too. You have to get to that point. Don't think that, that suddenly, um, because you just got married, that everything's going to be perfect. It takes a lot of time and work and effort to get there. And it's foolish to compare yourself to somebody who's been married for 10, 20, 30, 40 years and expect your marriage to be the same as their marriage. They've worked some things out. Sometimes we see that they, they seem just so happy. They get, they get along. They've got a good yin, yin and yang going together. Well, they've, they've probably had a few arguments. They've probably had a few conversations. They, they've gotten to know one another's likes and dislikes. They've had to work to that point of maturity. So don't compare yourself to them. Do the best you can in the situation that, that you are in. Comparing yourself to different people is foolish. It's a key to unhappiness. Reminds me of an old joke. You know, after being married for 50 years, uh, this, this individual says, I, I took a careful look at my wife one day and I said, you know, 50 years ago we had a cheap house, a junk car, slept on a sofa bed, and we watched a 10-inch black and white TV. But hey, he said, I got to sleep every night with a hot 23-year-old girl. He says, now I have a $750,000 home. I've got a $45,000 car, a nice big um, bed, a large screen TV, but I'm sleeping with a 73-year-old woman. So I said to my wife, it seems to me that you're not holding up your side of things. My wife, she said, is a very, he says, is a very reasonable woman. She told me, you go ahead and find that hot 23-year-old girl, and I'll make sure that you're once again leaving in a cheap house, driving a junk car, and sleeping on a sofa bed, and watching a 10-inch TV. Often, when we compare, we're comparing apples to oranges, and that gets us into trouble. Second thing that I should consider is be patient as you water your own grass. Be patient. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9. I think this one is right. Verse 9. We are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Another one builds on it. Let each one take heed how he builds on it. Grass doesn't get green without some work usually. He's talking about building individual churches, and not even the growth of every individual church was the same. They all had different maturation rates. They all had different positives, and they had different negatives. They had different strengths, and they had different weaknesses. But the key for Paul was, we just got to keep planting, and we've just got to keep watering, and we've just got to keep trusting God to give the increase. So just be patient as you keep watering. That's all you can do. And so in the situation that you're in, instead of looking at how we just want to jump into another situation, let's do the best that we can with where we're at. It's going to take some fertilization and some aeration and some seeding, some reseeding and the right amount of sun and water. But if you want to improve your situation, then you start improving yourself and the people and the things in your life and you wait for God to bless it. It's the same in gardening and soul winning. Growth isn't always immediate. It's a process. It's going to take time. And so be patient as you water your own grass. Keep working on yourself and your situation. Third thing, though, is learn contentment. And, and the key word here is learn contentment. Look at Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. 
Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. It says, Not that I speak in regard to need, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Paul says, whatever situation I've been in, he says, I know how to be abased. There's been times Paul was poor. Paul didn't have the support he needed to do the work. He says, but I also know how to abound. There was times he had more support than he needed, and he was doing well, and, and, and things were plentiful. He says, but everywhere in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, to abound and to suffer need, and that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Uh, notice verse 11, I have learned to be content. Learning contentment is important. It tells us something about contentment. It's not an innate trait. It has to be developed in our character. We must learn to be content with our spouse. And yes, your spouse, something you're going to figure out when you get married, has flaws. And you're going to have to learn to be content with your spouse, flaws and all. You're going to have to learn to be content with your income. Sure, you wish it was higher. Doesn't everybody? But learn to live within your means and be content with your income. Be content with your location. Yeah, there's no uh, beaches and there's no mountains over here, but guess that there's no hurricanes here either, okay? Be content with your location. Be content with your house. Even if we can think of better neighborhoods, there's always going to be a better neighborhood. Even if we can think of better luxuries, there's always going to be better luxuries and newer technology coming out. Just be content with what you have. Is it, do you have a roof over your head? Do you have food in your stomach? Do you have clothes on your back? Be content with what you have. Be content with your jobs. Even though we wish our boss was a little nicer, we wish our coworkers were a little more friendly, but you have a job. Be content with your job and do the best that you can in it and be content with your church family, even though they make mistakes that frustrate us sometimes and even though there might be a little conflict here and there, be content. And guess what? People have to learn to be content with you too. You're probably not Mr. or Miss Perfect either. And so they have to be content with your shortcomings and learn contentment. Fourthly, as we consider this greener pasture syndrome, this probably is one of the key points. Make sure that your greener pasture decisions are God's will. Are God's will. There may be a time you do feel moved to make a move. I obviously just moved here. So I'm not condemning moving. But how do we make those decisions? James tells us that it needs to be about more than just personal profit. It needs to be a decision that is based on God's will. In James chapter 4, notice verses 13 through 17. Verse 13 says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we'll go to such and such a city, we'll spend a year there, we'll buy and we'll sell, we'll make a profit. This is greener grass thinking. Right now, the market's hot in this place, in this city. Let's go to this city. Let's live there for a year or two. We'll make a lot of money. We'll make a profit. But James says in verse 14, you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? He says it's even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. What does James ask this person to say? Verse 15. You ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and we shall do this or that. Is this the Lord's will? Can I fulfill the Lord's will for me by going to this place or doing this job or pursuing this relationship? Is this the Lord's will for my life? Not my will, but thine be done has to be our thinking. You know, you could go to a state college on a free ride, but let's imagine there's no spiritual support system there and you may be spiritually weakened. Should you do it? Is it the Lord's will? 
We know the money's there. We know that's important. There's no spiritual support system. Maybe there's not even a church. I can tell you when you look at the numbers of people who, when they move out of the home and they're they're falling away, maybe that has a lot to do with it, friends. We're not thinking enough about is where they're going to go to college or continue their career, is this going to be good for them spiritually? Or you go to a private Christian college, but leaving here may weaken the people that you're able to influence if you stay with a local college, should you do it. I didn't stay at home. I, I, I stayed at home in Indianapolis. I went to IUPUI for my college. I paid for my own college, so that's the, the main reason why I stayed home, because it was affordable. But I didn't stay home with that thinking. But let me tell you, after staying home for five years, it took me five years to get through college and preaching, I can tell you that me staying home was good for the local church where I was. By the time I got done with college, we had two rows of high school and college-age kids. And when I started college, it was me and my brother. A lot of people congregated to that congregation because there were people looking for some spiritual support and leadership in that age bracket. And it was good for those five years to stay home. You get offered a job with a lot higher income, but you're in a place akin to a Sodom and Gomorrah culture, should you do it. You know, some cities in the U.S., they might be beautiful, but will they help you spiritually? Let me tell you, before you pick up your family and move to San Francisco, let me suggest to you that you better think really hard about whether that's going to be good for your family spiritually to be in that environment. And I could name off a few other cities where maybe the spiritual climate is not the type of spiritual climate you want to be raising a family in. And not just because of the city, but because there's no church in the city either. There's no support system, period. You have the means to move down to Florida, but you'd be a spectator at the church, and the church here really needs you, and they love you as you've built up years of influence. Should you do it? Are are we motivated by spiritual reasons or, or material reasons and wants? You could move out of mom and dad's house with a couple of friends, but they're not very spiritually minded. It could lead to some difficult temptations if you're living with them. So should you do it? Sometimes living with mom and dad is not really the worst option if it's better for you spiritually. You could take that new job, but they want you to travel, be gone five nights a week. You're going to have to work the afternoon shift, which means when your kids come home from school, you're never going to be home with them. And so it's going to compromise your time as a spiritual guide in their lives should you do it. You could leave the church to go somewhere where you can get lost in the crowd, maybe a bigger congregation where they don't ask you to do as much, and you have less responsibility to serve, but you're needed here. You're held accountable here should you do it. I'm asking you to consider the motives and the reasons why you're making the decisions that you're making. Are they material, are they physical, or are they spiritually motivated? Two more things. Count your blessings. At the heart of the reason why we want something else is because we're complaining about where we're at, the situation that we're in. And God would call you to be a person, if you're going to be have a heart like Him, to be a person who's not a complainer, but a person who counts your blessings and thinks about the positive aspects of things. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Verse 6, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Spend more time thinking about your blessings instead of thinking about your complaints. Sometimes our complaints are scriptural. They're justified. Sometimes, though, they indicate a heart problem. Sometimes, I want you to think about your prayer life for a moment. Sometimes our prayer lives may indicate that heart. When you pray, I'm talking when you get alone to pray, not in front of people, but when you get alone to pray, how much time do you spend in prayer just thinking and praising instead of asking and requesting? 
if you find that you're always just asking and requesting and you're never thinking about thanking and praising, then it may indicate that heart that only thinks about what we want instead of realizing what we have and being thankful for it. Both are valid. You do ask when you pray. You do have requests and petitions. But a heart of gratitude is going to thank God for its blessings and for people in our lives who are blessings. And when you take the time to really count your blessings and think about them, you'll realize how truly blessed you are and will be less tempted to complain. But the last thing I want you to consider, which is um, maybe the most important thing here, is consider Jesus. I want you to think about Jesus. Do you realize that Jesus did the very opposite of finding greener pastures? He actually left heaven to come to earth as a man to show us what true humility looks like. And he calls us to carry a mindset like him and to live like him. When you read 1 Peter, which is a letter that's written to people who are going through various trials, that's really what 1 Peter 2 and 3 are all about. That even in the midst of a difficult government, stay on mission and respect the king. Even while working for a harsh boss, stay on mission and do your job with grace. Even while you're married to a difficult spouse, stay on mission and be the best wife that he could ever ask to have. Even while you're dealing with church strife, stay the course and continue to endure, to shepherd, to lead through the storms. Stay on mission. Bloom where you're planted. God doesn't call us to a life of convenience, but to a life of service. And sometimes that service is in the form of a cross. That's part of carrying our cross, serving and sacrificing for others. The reality of it is the greener grass may never be ours on this side of eternity. We, we may have to suffer. We may never get to that green grass that we wish we had. But it is a promise of the life to come. And for that reason, God calls you to make it through your pilgrimage here. We're pilgrims here. We're sojourners. This is just temporary. So make it through your pilgrimage here so that one day you can enjoy the pleasures of eternity in heaven. That's the greener grass that I want to live for. That's the greener grass that God calls us to live for. And it requires a lesser focus on material things, a greater focus on spiritual things.